Hello, welcome along to the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan. This is the greatest podcast in the universe. And it's an Easter weekend. So it's a double win for you. Today we'll have a look at one of the weirdest, cutest, deadly creatures around. Also, you can hear why Earth is safe from an asteroid. And I've got your questions to answer as always. Today, they're big. What is nothing? Where did humans start? And something about a sea cucumber as well. That's coming up next. First, let's get into it with our alien friends who need to get themselves back home. This is NNG. NNG's Energy Challenge. I was just thinking. This doesn't usually end well. What are you eating? Some delicious earth sweets. Not quite as delicious as crater pops, but still. Anyway, I was thinking, why don't they make electricity cables out of these strawberry cables? They're delicious. And probably a lot cheaper than all that metal stuff. I don't think sweets and electricity ever go together that well. But why don't we ask the Quizler? Great idea. Welcome to electquizzery.com. Find out more about energy on Earth and post your questions for the Quizler. I'll type in our question. Why aren't electricity cables made of strawberry candy? Or loom bands. They're fun too and stretchy. You could stretch them in a long chain around the country. (laughs) Or loom bands. Electricity is made up of tiny electrons travelling in one direction, a bit like a flowing river. How fast or slow this river travels depends on the material they are travelling through. What is it now? I'm just remembering the lush purple rivers on Zog. Do you think we'll ever get home? Shush. Some materials, like metals, are super easy for electricity to travel through. Any substance which is easy for electricity to travel through is called a conductor. This is why electricity cables are made of copper or aluminium. These metals are great conductors. So that's why cables can't be made out of strawberry candy or loom band. I mean, really, of all the daft ideas, that has to be the prize winner. All right, all right, just thinking outside the box. Other materials, like plastics and rubber, are very difficult for electricity to travel through. These types of substances are called insulators. I bet the muds from the northern Zog Swamp Forests would be an insulator. Nothing can get through there. Fair point. Is your granny still there? Didn't she set off on a one-person swimathon to cross the Swamp Forest last year? We don't like to talk about that. Insulators might not sound very helpful where electricity is involved, but the fact they can slow down or block the current is a very good way to keep safe. Think about the cables and plugs attached to electrical items around the home. They're made of plastic. So are the plug sockets in the wall. This all helps to keep you safe because the electricity can't travel through these substances into your body. How else can we stay safe, Quizzler? If your gadgets and toys have cables which are damaged, then don't use the item and tell a grown-up straight away. Electricity could travel from the wires inside directly into your body. This is the same reason why you should never poke things into plug sockets. Electricity will travel easily through the object and into you. And I, for one, do not want to carry out an experiment to see if I am a conductor or an insulator. That's the most sensible thing you've said all day. Watch out! Looks like we're going to fuse, G! Here it comes! Whoopee! I love a bit of fusion! Here it comes! Woohoo! NNG's Energy Challenge with support from National Grid. Find out more online at funkitslive.com slash energy. Time for your questions, then. It seriously is my favourite part of the show. Uh, And I speak to some proper experts, which are amazing as well. So that's how much I love when you send in your questions as a review over on Apple Podcasts. And I have to turn into like a little science Sherlock Holmes trying to figure out the answer. Uh, Today, we've got a few. Some are big, some are small. This one is small. It's from Roblox Lover 231 who wants to know what is a sea cucumber? A sea cucumber is an echinoderm, which is a creature in the ocean. It's like a starfish or a sea urchin. And there are over 1,250 known species of sea cucumbers. They live all over the sea, some in shallow waters, some in the deep ocean. And the strange thing is they look like something from Doctor Who, like a spiky or furry slug in the sea. They keep going, they eat tiny particles like algae or small creatures that are floating by. Uh, They can breed with themselves or with a partner. Oh, and speaking of Doctor Who, uh, earlier on, uh, they can even regenerate part of their body parts that they lose. And they're even eaten by humans. 
I mean, they don't look tasty at all. So I'm not really sure what that's all about. Uh, but sea cucumbers are like one of nature's most bafflingly brilliant things, I think. Look up a picture when you get the chance. Now, here is a huge one. Uh, I'm going to have a stab at it. But I think we need we might need to get on like like a proper expert. It's very hard for me to explain. It's very hard for Albert Einstein to explain. Very hard for anyone to explain. Because no one really knows. It's from Alex in Weybridge who wants to know, if there was nothing before the Big Bang, what is surrounding the nothingness? Surely only nothing can be around nothing. If there's nothing about, then there's nothing anywhere. You see why I'm going to have trouble with this one, Alex. So there was nothing. Just then something called a singularity happened, which uh, isn't anything, really. It's just everything came from nothing. There was one moment where nothing suddenly became something. Now, it didn't happen, scientists don't, don't think, in a huge, like a huge explosion where metal shards fly everywhere. It was a, a, a bang. And then everything just came outwards. And there is nothing around the universe. It's expanding on itself, if that makes that sense. Don't think of it like a like a car just getting further down the road. Uh, It's more like a balloon that you blow up and everything's getting bigger. That's inside. All the gas is, is moving further away from each other. That's how the universe is expanding. It is a tremendously hard question to try and answer. Uh, some of the brightest minds on the planet can't really figure it out. They're still working it out. They're still trying to figure out what happened at the very start. How did something come from nothing? Uh, but I'll do my best to find a proper genius expert who can help you out with that one, Alex. Thank you for the question. Uh, here's another big one as well. It's from Sophia, who is 10 years old, who wants to know, if we have evolved over years, what did humans start out as? Well, I guess kind of leading on from Alex's question, Sophia, everything really is evolved from cells that were at the start of everything. Now, the earliest known humans lived about two and a half million years ago, uh, Homo habilis, and that spawned many different kind of human-y creatures. We are Homo sapiens. There are Neanderthals as well. uh, And there are a few more. Um, Homo sapiens have kind of won that battle, though. We've won the race. We didn't evolve from apes. Uh, Both humans and apes evolved from a common ancestor. We went one way, they went the other. And scientists are still figuring out what happened in that time. But really, what humans started out as was something called Homo habilis. We were on two legs, and that was around two and a half million years ago. Thank you for the question. If you've got something sciencey that you'd love answered on the show, you need to leave it as a review for me over on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. This week, very big for us. We're learning all about the Mars Perseverance rover mission. You might remember it launched in July last year. It landed in February, just gone, and we are going big for this. Uh, We are chatting to NASA. Becca Siegfried is an engineer for surface operations with Mars 2020 at NASA. She is in Los Angeles right now. Very fancy. Becca, thanks for joining us. Yeah, happy to be here. Thank you so much. Now, I guess the first question is when Perseverance l- landed, rather, in February, uh, massive celebrations all over the world. But do many people know why it's there? Maybe you can tell us. Yeah, so NASA has sent Perseverance and Perseverance's sidekick, Ingenuity, to the red planet, to Mars. And we are actually there this time to start search for ancient life on the planet. So we've had many missions in the past that have searched for the evidence that that life could have existed on Mars. And now with this mission, we're actually going to go and see if we can find those fossils, find the evidence to see if life ever existed on the red planet before. Is it a bit of a blind search, Becca, or do you know what you're looking for and you know where you might find it? Yeah, that's a great question, Dan. We we have some idea. Um, we are looking for life as we know it, as, as human beings know life. That's what we're going to search for. It's possible, though, that Mars life might look a little different from Earth life. So we have a pretty good idea of what we're looking for. And that's why we've built these science instruments to go and look for the life that we think we want to find and think we know is there. But it's possible that we will find something that we've never seen before on another planet, uh, just on, on our next planet next to us, which is Mars. 
How will you know whether that is life, though, Becca? If we're looking for life as we know it, so what we understand life to be, things that are like us that might need water. But say you do find something completely alien while you're up there. How will you decide, hang on, this is something different, but it is life after all? Yeah, so there are these things called the building blocks of life. There are elements in nature um, that make up our, our entire universe that we believe are the building blocks of life as we know it. And so uh, you mentioned one of them, Dan, which is water. We believe that life needs water to exist. We also believe that there are a few elements that naturally exist, like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen that help create life. So these are the things that we're going to be looking for when we get to Mars. Um, when We're going to be looking for fossils. So like not big dinosaur bones per se, but uh, small little uh, ne- microbial naps, really, really small things that exist in the layers of the rocks and looking for these signs of what we think for it, what we think of as life. Um, and so, and so everything points to the fact that Mars has the same building blocks, but that's what, that's actually what we're going to go figure out. And we might find something else, but it should, it should, um, we, you know, we'll see it when we will discover it when we get there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if Mars has what we think of as most of the building blocks for for life, how confident are you that actually we might find something after all? I am fairly confident I, with, and the reason I say that is. Um, all the Mars missions that have come before Perseverance, Spirit and Opportunity and Curiosity, they've each taken a step towards answering this question um, and, and seeing if life existed there. And, and with every mission, we have discovered something new and something very interesting that points to the fact that life could existed on Mars. So it's totally a personal opinion. I think if you ask, if you take a survey of everybody that I work with, you'll probably get very mixed answers. But I personally would love to believe that Perseverance will hopefully find life on Mars and will help us get one step closer to, uh, t- to answering that question. Let me take you back to the 19th of February this year, 2021. The day after Perseverance lands, finally makes it safely on Mars. What did you do next, Becca, as a, as an engineer for surface operations? What was your job the next day with Perseverance? Yeah, so <clears throat> first of all, I was very, very tired that day. <laughs> um, I, there was a lot of anxiety and excitement that fed into the day before when we landed and uh, after we could all take a big sigh of relief, um, that's when the the tired hit me. However, I couldn't rest very long because we had a whole mission ahead of us. So as an engineer on the mission, a mission operations engineer, on the 19th, we saw the pictures of of the rover and its surroundings, its new home. And we were able to get down a lot more images that second day after landing. Um, so we took a look at those and, and really every image that came down, the entire project was just in awe. We looked at these images and we just couldn't believe we had made it, that all of the eight years of work that each of us had put into, we finally made it. And we were looking at pictures of the red planet, Perseverance's new home. It was just incredible. So we got to work. Uh, you know, We started building out the sequences of activities that the rover was going to execute now that we were in this landing spot. Um, we had to deploy a lot of the science and engineering instruments um, to make sure that we could perform our mission. So one of the things we did is the rover's head was laying down on the deck of the rover and we had to what we call deploy or uh, 
you know, raise up the head. And so that was one of the first things we did was we sent a sequence to tell the rover to lift its head up and look around and take some pictures. Um, and, and so we continued to do this throughout the coming days after we landed to get the vehicle prepared to perform its mission. Now, listen, you right now, from where I am, you're about five and a half thousand miles away. And uh, the line that we're using to talk to each each other, it's holding up pretty well. I'll be honest, I've spoken to some people down the road and it's much, much worse than this. But um, you're speaking to Perseverance Rover, 253 odd million kilometers away. It's a long, long way. How are you speaking to Perseverance? How are you controlling it? Yeah, so... That's always uh, that's a, always a fun question to answer. You know, a lot of people think that we communicate the rover almost like a video game, where we have a joystick and we tell the rover to turn a corner and then turn another corner, and we're constantly having a, a communication, like a conversation with the rover. We speak to it, it speaks back to us. Then we speak to it, then it speaks back to us. But in actuality, we send an entire day's worth of activities for the rover all in one big bundle. And that's what we call it, a bundle of activities. And we tell the rover, you know, over the course of the next eight hours, we want you to drive to this rock and then deploy the arm. So <clears throat> get, get the arm out and put it on this rock and take this science instrument. Uh, sorry, take the science measurement and then look around and take some pictures. So we tell it to do all of these activities over the course of the next eight day, eight hours. And then we bundle it up in a little package and we send it out of the deep space network, these big dish antennas that are located all over the planet. We um, send this bundle out into the into space and about 11 minutes later, it reaches the rover. So that's how long it takes for us to communicate to the rover. And then once it receives this bundle, it then starts executing its activities. And then when it's done with its activities, it sends us back all the data that it collected throughout the day, uh, including images and videos and other things. How does it know where it is? You said there that one of the things you might tell it is, I want you to go and take a picture of this rock. I want you to inspect over there. How does it know where that rock is? Does it have kind of like a Google Maps of Mars in its brain? That's exactly, almost exactly what it, it has. <laughs> um, so it has instrumentation on board that tells us the location. Um, so you can think of it kind of like a GPS system. Um, we have a different instrumentation, but it's similar. And it tells us down to the millimeter how we're able to point and we're able to place the arm on uh, and instruments on the arm on rocks down to the millimeter of point of accuracy. So we do a lot of work and calibrate all of our instrumentation and everything to allow us the the precision of pointing the vehicle and placing the vehicle exactly where we want it. So it's not an easy thing to do, but we spend a lot of time making sure it's perfect. Now, Becca, can I tell you a secret? Yes, please. <laughs> I'm terrified of robots. As in, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm constantly worried about what robots are going to do one day, whether they will be the end of me. How worried are you that Perseverance, when it's up there, might think, you know what, I don't want to send anything down to those humans on Earth anymore. <laughs> so, you know, I think there are really, people are working on making robots really intelligent. And most of those robots are being worked on on Earth. Perseverance still asks us lots of questions and needs a lot of help. And so it doesn't necessarily have all the smarts to be completely on its own and to think for itself. It has some capability to do that. But the reason for that, Dan, is because, because Perseverance is on another planet and we don't necessarily always know exactly what we're looking for, we can't code in to tell the rover exactly what to do all by itself. We have to have the scientists on the ground, on Earth, help us figure out where the rover should go next and if that rock is interesting and if the science that we're getting back, uh, if it's telling us we should go a different direction. 
we need our human brains to help unpack that science information so we know so we know what to do next and so we we have purposely not allowed the rover to think a lot on its own because we still as human beings need to help it uh, because we're on another planet and we really don't know exactly what we we want or are looking for now this mission perseverance mars 2020 it's been a it's been a long time in the planning uh, where we are right now uh, recording this what in, in march 2021 how much does nasa know about what it's going to be doing in in 10 years in 20 years in 30 years time yeah that's a good question so um we we don't know what we're going to be doing that far out but we definitely plan you know about a month at a time. Uh, and so we look like as far as a month to three months down the road, that's it. Um, however, the one thing that we do know very, very well is is the summary of all the things that we want to find in this first Martian year. So if so from a, from a planning perspective, I would say at the highest level, we know what we want to do within a given Martian year. Now, I'm very specific when I say a Martian year because the Martian year is actually two Earth years. So for every two Earth years, we have one Martian year, and that's about the length of, of how far out we know. What the, so we have a lot of goals for the rover and all of these goals that we have in our head. We don't necessarily know how they're going to get executed, but we have them and they all fit inside of this one Martian year or two Earth years. Now, lastly, I'd like an answer from this, but you don't need to tell me what it is, all right? You don't need to tell me what they are if the answer is yes. Um, does NASA have any... Does it, does it know anything about space that it's not telling the rest of us? <laughs> I would tell you the answer to that is no. <laughs> we, we, we do know... <clears throat> What we discover, really, we want to make it public. We want people to be able to see what we're seeing. So within 24 hours of us receiving images from Mars, all of those become public to all of you. You can see what we see within 24 hours. So I will say, Dan, there might be a few hours or maybe even up to a day of us knowing something that the rest of the world doesn't. Um, but fairly quickly, we make everything available for all of you to see. So you can join with us on our journey and, and come along and help us uh, find life on Mars. Do you know what's in Area 51? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. But I am just as curious as all of you are um, with Area 51. <laughs> uh, very good. Well, well, listen, I mean, the, the Perseverance mission has it just encaptured the whole world. We're, we're loving being back in space again. It's brilliant. And news that we'll go to the moon soon as well is, is fantastic. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. It's been huge for us. Becca Siegfried, thank you for coming on the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you for having me, Dan. This week's Dangerous Dan is all about one of the weirdest, deadly creatures in the world. Have you ever seen a Cayenne Slow Loris? They are a nocturnal primate. They look a little bit like a lemur. They're found in the jungles on Borneo, which is an island in Asia. They're a grey, brown, kind of black and white colour. They've got wide eyes that look small on a ridiculously cute, large face. And its soft, beautiful fur is just begging to be petted. The problem is, one touch could be your last. They are the only known venomous primates. Their bites are extremely toxic. They can kill if left untreated. A small bite on your finger can lead to anaphylactic shock, which is where your mouth and chest swell, your throat gets bigger as well, you feel sick, and all that's happening, it means you can't breathe. The problem is, we didn't know much about this side of them until quite recently. We just thought they were a cute creature up in the trees. But then scientists started studying them, the slow loris, and found out the truth that this cute tree hugger that wanders down branches, it's one of the most strange, deadly animals on the planet. It's time to look what's happening inside your body now with our microbe friends. This is Benny and Mal. Benny and Mal's body teasers with supports from the Nuffield Council on bioethics. Ah, oh, hello again. Now, as Nurse Nanobot loves to point out, my lab can get a bit messy. 
But what she doesn't realise is there's an awful lot of interesting stuff going on under all that mess. Take Benny and Mal, for instance. They are microbes, that single-celled organisms to you and me, who live at the bottom of an old test tube. And being single-celled organisms, they are very single-minded. Just have a listen. Benny and Mal never agree on anything. So, lads, what's the hot topic today? Boy, lads, what's the hot topic? Sorry, mate. Would be easier if Mal here was prepared to share the microphone for once. And talking of sharing, we're talking about sharing personal data. That's information about our bodies. Could be basic stuff like how tall we are, how much we weigh. Or it could be information about how healthy we are and whether we've had any illnesses recently. You see, the idea is that if doctors and scientists share information they have about us, they could make better medicines and treatments. But hang on, aren't we told that we shouldn't share personal information? We don't go around telling random strangers our names or where we live. Why is it suddenly okay for doctors to have a good old gossip about us? It's hardly a gossip. It's a massive job keeping everyone healthy and coming up with new medicines all the time. If doctors knew that 239 people were complaining about having a huge and embarrassing red spot on their noses, they might think, hmm, sounds like we need more spot cream. But if I had a huge and embarrassing red spot, I wouldn't want everyone knowing about it. But what if doctors also knew that all 239 people had cats? They could link facts together to get a bigger picture and perhaps make some helpful discoveries, like maybe it's the cats causing the spots. Get rid of the cats and bingo bango, no more spots. Job done. Stuff like that could solve the problem without using medicine at all. No, still don't like the idea. You're serious? Not even if it helped other people with huge and embarrassing red spots on their noses. Nope, I don't want to be known as that microbe with the massive spot. All right, all right, calm down, mate. It's just a thought experiment. So what if they didn't know it was you? What if it was just a number of people who had had a massive red spot and you were just number... I don't know, 239? Yep, I think that being anonymous would be better. Especially if I don't know who's actually looking at the information. Fair point. All that data can be valuable and could even be sold. Whoa! Now, I think I would definitely want to know if information about my body was being sold to some big company. Could be a little company or just a person with a massive wadge of cash. Not liking that, Benny, especially if they just want the money to go on an expensive holiday. My body belongs to me, and so does the information about it. You can't go selling stuff that doesn't belong to you in the first place. But what if the person buying the data is developing new medicines that can save thousands of lives? Would you feel okay with that? Probably yes, when it's in everybody's interest. It's a brain-busting body bamboozler for sure. Sure is. Catch you next time. Benny and Mal's Body Teasers, with support from the Nuffield Council on Bioethics. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash Benny and Mal. Let's get this week's science in the news. The earliest cherry blossoms since records began have sprung up in Japan. The cherry blossom season, it's a plant, the cherry blossom, it peaked on the 26th of March, which is the earliest they have been there in uh, 1,200 years. Experts think that it's linked to climate change as the city of Kyoto in Japan has experienced a very warm spring. Also, NASA says Earthlings can breathe a sigh of relief. They have confirmed that the planet is safe from a fearsome asteroid uh, for at least 100 years. NASA said that this asteroid, Apophis, it was one of the most dangerous asteroids when they found it in 2004. They thought that it might come close in 2029 and then 2036, but you don't need to worry. Now they have studied the path and they say there is no impact risk for at least 100 years. And finally, scientists in Argentina have found the skull of a large meat-eating dinosaur who is nicknamed the one who causes fear in local language. It had horns, it was five metres long, it roamed around 85 million years ago, two legs, tiny arms, but much smaller than the giant T-Rex. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. If you have something sciencey that you want answered, a question that you want answered on the show, leave it as a review for me over on Apple Podcasts. You can also send it as an email over to my page at funkidslive.com. Uh, Apple is one of the best places that you can hear loads of brilliant science podcasts that we do. Podcasts about all sorts, actually. Uh, books, days out, 
history we've got them all on the apple podcast store on google spotify they're on the free fun kids app and at funkidslive.com as well and fun kids we're a children's radio station from the uk you can listen to us all around the country on your DAB digital radio on that free fun kids app and at funkidslive.com 